<laughs> oh, life is good. Every once in a while, a video just kind of writes itself. And I don't even write these, but it writes itself. Okay, so a couple years ago, I did a video on Karasu, like shortly after the Revolutionary Army commanders were first revealed, because Karasu's Devil Fruit is the weirdest out of all of them, right? All the other Revolutionary commanders kind of fit in the categories. Uh, like Morley's was clearly a Paramecia, Bello Betty's was a Paramecia, Lindbergh doesn't have have one he's just a steampunk cat like that's that's all Lindbergh is but then you get to Karasu who has the ability to turn into crows but like not in the standard zone way he turns into a murder of crows all right so I did a video all about that and that video was positively filled to the brim with really bad crow puns. So I thought, let's continue that tradition today. Get ready. If you are adverse to really, if you are sensitive to excessive puns, you should probably turn this video off and go for a walk or something like that. All right, I'm really sorry. All right, let's get the festivity started, shall we? <clears throat> what do you call two crows that spend a lot of time together? Velcros. Like, oh god! <laughs> Just like, that was painful! There's so many more! There's so many bad crow puns! I'll give one more, and then we'll get into the topic, and I'll sprinkle the other ones throughout. Okay, what's another? Oh, what's a crow's favorite beverage? Crow's favorite beverage. Anybody? Coffee! Coffee! Yeah, I know! I love it! I love the crow puns! All right, all right, let's get to it. Let's get to it. All right. So uh, last couple of chapters, actually. I'm kind of glad. I was going to make this video right after chapter 1083. I'm kind of glad I waited till 84, because in the last chapter, even, we had a little bit extra knowledge about Kar Karasu's Devil Fruit and how it works, okay? So Karasu has a Logia. I don't know if it's ever been directly stated, like, in the title box, or Karasu himself said I it's a Logia, but it's clearly a Logia. It's the Soot Soot Fruit, or the Susu Susu no Mi. Uh, say that to times fast and it has the ability to for him to turn into soot so every time we see those birds the crows flying around that is literally just karasu taking his element of soot and molding it into the shape of crows and then having the crows fly around now even in the extent of a logia this is weird and i've mentioned this several times the idea that you could split your your body your element into a bunch of different like they're not living animals but a bunch of animal shape forms and then spread them out over a large area that is not really anything we have seen from other logias okay to the point where i mean you could just say okay karasu is awakened which he very well could be um every time we always talk about awakened logias we talk about the weather being uh, affected by that like at punk hazard where you had uh aokiji and akainu having their big battle for like 10 days they are admirals they both have logias they're probably awakened and that resulted in the weather of punk hazard being permanently altered also you got raijin island in the new world that might have been a previous user of eneru's goro goro no mi so it makes sense but you know soot is not the same kind of thing as lightning or magma or ice or the uh, like the aspect of cold that aokiji embodies um it's just soot it's the remnants of whenever you burn uh organic magma matter is that black substance of soot that you get on yourself it can also cause cancer so there you go added to another devil fruit alongside smokers uh plume plume fruit is smoke smoke fruit that also can cause cancer in that regard so karasu could just do that take a crow do all like naruto with it whenever itachi summoned the crow and like shoved it down naruto's throat karasu could do that as well but it would cause you like severe lung infection and, and or possibly lung cancer so karasu has a very devastating devil fruit when you really think about the a the applications there, right? So anyway, yeah, it's a little different. It's an, it's an aspect of, like, pollution rather than it is, like, a natural weather phenomenon, like, you know, like lightning is, for example, or, like, something natural, like, from the earth. I guess soot is natural because there is places where, like, black smoke can arise that's, like, heavy in certain chemicals and organic matter is being burned and, and stuff like that, right? So, uh, interesting there. So... The reason why Karasu, they, he turns the soot into crows, I like to think it really has nothing to do with a limitation of the fruit itself. Karasu could probably mold that soot into, like, anything he wanted. He could make it into a falcon, or a cardinal, or a bluebird. Okay, probably not the bluebird, but he could make any type of bird out of these, you know, out of this soot. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, Karasu 
could even make other animals out of soot. He could make a buffalo out of soot. He could make a dog out of soot. He could make anything. He could make humans out of soot. Any shape that he wants if he really has that level of finesse and control with his Logia. I like to think, though, the reason why he picked crows is because he's just really a big fan of crows. They're like his favorite bird, his favorite animal. In fact, this is complete headcanon, but I find it hilarious. So there is a Devil Fruit Encyclopedia in One Piece, right? And the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia, sometimes it includes pictures of the fruit, sometimes it doesn't. You know, it's not very complete. But I like to think that Karasu, his entire life, he has his little murder of crows, his little group of crows that he feeds and he takes care of, and he just loves crows and he's like ah oh, yes my lovely crows i'm just so happy when i spend time with all my my birds and they're like ah we love you too karasu Caw! you know and so karasu one day is looking at the devil fruit encyclopedia and he sees the crow zone which you know there would be a crow zone i mean come on now there's a falcon zone there's a hawk zone i think in one of the movies so yeah there'd be a crow zone all right where you just turn into like literally the karasu karasu no me it's a crow crow fruit right so he's looking at it in the devil fruit encyclopedia and I like to think that there's just a description that says this fruit is colored black because crows are black, you know? So it's like, oh, if I ever find a pitch black devil fruit, that could be the crow crow fruit. And I could realize my dreams and fly through the sky with my birdie brethren. <laughs> you know, like that's what Karasu wanted so bad. And then one day he stumbles upon a devil fruit that's pitch black and he's like, oh my God. I found it! I found it! I can finally become a crow, you know? I will join the Night's Watch, you know? And so he eats it, and he's so happy, and then he just <laughs> turns into a pile of soot right there on the spot. And he's so... And it, you gotta feel bad for him, because, like, if somebody else eats the devil fruit that you really wanted, like the situation with Sanji and Absalom, it's not the end of the world. Sanji was really upset that Absalom stole the clear, clear fruit, but Sanji, man, you could have just killed Absalom and the fruit would have been reincarnated, and that was a weird way to pronounce that, reincarnated, and then you could get it some other day, you know? You, like, the, the chances of you getting it are not completely done, it's reincarnated somewhere in the world that you can grab, right? However, if you screw up and eat the wrong devil fruit, other than the one you actually wanted, you're done. You don't get a second chance because you can't eat another one or you'll explode. Or at least we're told that you explode if you eat both of them. That's never actually been shown in the story. And of course, Blackbeard is the exception to this. Um, but, you know, seriously, for most people, though, if you eat a devil fruit and it wasn't the one you want and you messed up, it's like, oh, no, now I'm stuck as just a pile of soot, you know? And I like to think Harasu spent several days just as a pile of soot on the ground next to the fireplace and he's just depressed, and he's just like, I don't know, man. And then that's when the revolutionaries got him out of his stupor. Like, you can be whatever you want to be, man! Just because you ate a, a logia that turns you into a literal pile of soot that causes cancer, you can be anything you want, Karasu! And then Karasu is like damn straight and he got on the grind and Karasu worked every single day it was hard work trying to mold his soot into the shape of a crow and he's like ah and then it falls apart and he's like oh I'm almost there and he worked day in and day out like night after night you know epic music is playing in the background you know rocky training music is going the scorpions are amping up in the background right and then finally after years and years of training Karasu awakens the soot soot fruit and he could form as many crows as he wants and he can divide his consciousness between the crows he can see what the crows see he can speak through the crows he can manipulate them he can even give his soot to other people and then they can summon his crows at will that is Karasu's ultimate dream <laughs> It reminds me a little bit, and I love a lot of that. That was all headcanon, by the way. But a lot of that kind of reminds me of the way you would, like, train Nen in Hunter x Hunter. Where it's like, if you want a specific ability, like, to do this one thing, you have to work at it. And, like, your own personality is, like, it's a factor there. And keep in mind, remember what Vegapunk said, you know, not too long ago. Devil Fruits kind of come about through desire. So it kind of makes me wonder... If you eat a devil fruit that's a different kind of fruit than what you wanted, could you shift the devil fruit to be more of what you wanted if you had a strong enough desire for it? You know what I mean? Because we've seen a lot of devil fruits that have a particular theme, but then there's other abilities in the fruits that's just like, where did that come from? You know what I mean? 
I was going to use Luffy as an example because, you know, he has the rubber rubber fruit, the gumu gumu no me, and he could, like, light himself on fire and channel electricity and do all that crazy stuff. But we later find out that's a mythical zone and he's literally a deity. So Luffy's doesn't really apply. But there have been other devil fruits that have a specific set of rules. And it's like there's one or two abilities in that fruit that's just like, ah, that doesn't seem to line up. Or that's like really stretching it a little bit. What, and Karasu is a perfect example of that. So what if Karasu, the way his fruit operates differently from every other Logia, is not because the Logia itself is anything special. It's not like he's a special Logia or a different category it's just the soot soot fruit logia but karasu really 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 wanted the crow zone he really wanted to turn into a crow all right and so because of that because of his desire because of his want to become a crow he molded all of his soot and it just it took him a while but he mastered his logia in a way that no other Logia in the story has really gotten to that point where they're able to segment off all the different parts of their body into the animal and then they can speak through them and see things through them and communicate with other people like no other Logia has been capable of that and there's some really like all the admirals are really skilled in having their powers it's not an issue of having the power for a long time like Borsalino Kizaru he had his Pika Pika Nomi ever since um Ever since he brought in Arlong, way back, like, over ten years ago, he's had his fruit, right? Also, uh, we know that, so, Akainu is red dog, and we saw a technique with a red dog. Uh, Akai uh, Aokiji is blue pheasant, and we saw a pheasant, it's pheasant beak and pheasant peck in the Viz. But we saw him with an ability to turn the ice into the shape of a pheasant and attack with that. I think Kizaru, I don't think, because it's a Kizaru, so yellow monkey, I don't think we've ever seen Kizaru summon a yellow monkey out of light all right but uh he might be able to in like the shape but like if kizaru really just loved monkeys you know maybe if he really worked at it he could mold the light into a bunch of shapes of like little monkeys that like dance around with the symbols or something like i guess it's just it comes down to what you want your devil fruit to be and if you're willing to work hard at it every single day you can eventually reach that level okay with that being said, I think we're time for another, uh, we're overdue for another crow pun. Um, let's see, uh, what do you need to have a murder of crows? Probable cause. Probable cause. Yes. Um, let's see, what do we here? Um, what would you say to, uh, somebody that, uh, stole a bunch of crows? You would say that, uh, you got away with murder. Everybody, anybody still there? Anybody still watching right now? Everybody's just stopped watching the video. They didn't even pause it. They just literally just got up from whatever they were watching the video on and just walked outside, just walked out of the room. They just put their phone down and just, no, the video's still playing. I'm just gone. All right, I'm out of here. I can't anymore. All right. So, um... Last chapter, we saw Sabo and Bonnie running through Pangea Castle, and Sabo has the keys to the detonating collars. And so he's like, Karasu, I need you. Now, the way that the panel seemed to uh, express this ability was that Sabo had some soot on his glove or inside of his jacket or something. It wasn't like he called Karasu, like, Karasu, come down here, I need you. And then the bird just swooped down and he gave the, the crow the keys and it flew away. No, because you see the, the soot kind of around Sabo's glove so it seemed like hold on a second Bonnie and he like reached into his jacket pocket or something and then whoosh you know threw the soot out and then it you know solidified into the form of a crow and he's like yes Sabo I'm here to assist you he's like I have the keys oh thank you great I will use these to free the slaves are you coming he's like I'll be right behind you and he's like okay and then he flies away Ca -ca! you know flies out the door all right cool great so that's something interesting also the fact that okay even if you want to say that Sabo did not summon Karasu, that the bird was just kind of always around him or whatever. Karasu is still, like, several miles away, all right? So in terms of not just a battle capability that this has, which it does, and we'll get to that in a moment, sensory aspects of this fruit are crazy. And it really makes me wonder if other Logias could do this, all right? Because, like, even look at Eneru. Eneru... He added to this in a way that was not the same thing that Karasu's doing, but 
um, Enaru combined his already good mantra or his observation hockey with his Goro Goro no Mi. So, you know, Enaru's mantra was already really good, but then using the, ele the electricity, the uh, lightning fruit, he was able to, like, bolster it, like, you know, the waves of lightning or whatever to actually, like, basically he was a giant radio tower that knew everything that was happening on uh, Skypea, right? So that's how he did it. So it makes me also think that, like, what if Karasu just has really high spec, really good observation hockey, and because he trained with his fruits so well in conjunction with that observation hockey, um, he's able to know everything that's going on around him. Like, if he just sprinkles a little bit of his soot over here, he kind of knows. He can kind of turn that soot into a crow, even if he's, like, several miles away. He can hear what's going on through that soot. He can speak through the soot. Once again, it doesn't need to take the form of a crow. Maybe in Karasu's case, maybe it does because he's trained with only making the shape of a crow. Going back to Nen, that's kind of what it reminds me of. Like, Karasu focuses only on molding his soot into the shape of a crow. He could, in theory, shape it into other animals or maybe human beings or whatever. He can make a really cool, like, knight and it has, like, a sword of soot and a shield of soot and it's just like, have at thee! You're like, maybe he could do that, but it's not what he's um, proficient in, okay? So... With that being said, though, it, it doesn't matter, though. He, he can take in form into a crow, and he can listen to whatever's going on, and he can have a conversation. So the sensory aspects of this are insane. So in terms of abilities, um, he names his abilities. His names, they're crow puns in and of themselves, which is what I love, okay? So his one ability is Karasusu. So Karasu means crow, and Susu is soot. So Karasusu. That's perfect. And it just means um, soot crow, and then boom, he creates the crows out of soot. And that's what he uses most of the time when he's just dividing his body up in order to make them, okay? Also, I mean, they're still technically part of his body, which is how he can talk through them and everything like that, um, which is interesting in of itself because just a Logia dividing their element out and spreading it over the area of, like, several miles. Because Sabo and Bonnie were in Pangea Castle, which is already huge, and then Karasu was fighting against Fujitora all the way over over in the Celestial Dragon City. There was there was at least a mile or two of space in between them, if not more. And then Sabo himself is inside this giant castle, okay? We've never seen any other Logia. Like, we, we, we've never seen, like, uh, th th this would be like if Aokiji broke off part of his ice and gave it to Blackbeard, and it's like, all right, I can communicate with you through that ice. I'm out of here. Like, we've never seen that before. So this is really interesting, okay? So that's Kara Susu. And then he has an ability called... Um, oh, oh, it's, a pair, it's a pun on obelisk. So it's obelisk, but it's obel, obel Susu. <laughs> All right, susu, which just means obelisk, and it's a, a form where he can, like, congeals the, the crows together for an attack. I think this is the one he used against Fujitora, where he just summons all the crows to attack at once, you know, to, like, to peck everybody up, apart and everything. So, it's, it's, they're all crow puns, and I love them. I would love for Karasu to have a melee weapon, and it to be a crowbar. Karasu fights with a crowbar, which would be, it would be funny in and of itself just because of the naming pun, but I want you to picture this for a moment. I want you to picture, like, Karasu's going up against um, somebody that has, like, C-Prism cuffs or C-Prism bullets or something like that, and Karasu's there fighting him, and he gets shot, and he can't use his Logia anymore, and so the person is just like, ha-ha, I shot you with a uh, C-Prism bullet. Can't use that stupid soot fruit anymore, can you, Karasu? And then Karasu just pulls a damn crowbar out of his, like, feathered boa, and he's just like, oh, <laughs> time for me to... Time for me to summon a, a different kind of murder. And he's just like, he pulls out a crowbar and starts beating people to death with a crowbar. You know, the crowbar is an underrated weapon. It really is. You know, there's not as many characters in anime that just whip out a crowbar. You know what I mean? But if there's anybody that does, it's Karasu. Speaking of, this is an obvious one, but uh, where do crows go to drink? A crowbar. Yeah, there you go. That's an easy... That was really bad even for me. You know what? I'm done. I'm done. That was bad even for me. I'm out of here. Bye, everybody. Enjoy silence for the next 20 minutes. Nah, nah. All right, all right. There's still things to discuss. There's still things to talk about. Um, Karasu's ultimate attack. 
I could think of a few variants here, okay? <laughs> First of all, he makes a giant crow, right? Like, he just congeals his entire body, because he's he can mold his body into the shape of, of crows, like multiple crows. Why can't he change his whole body and just, like, fan it out, kind of like what Smoker does with his smoke? Instead of just, you know, forming that, though, he forms into a giant crow, and then he attacks the enemy with that. That'd be pretty cool. Also, he could turn into a giant crow and then, like, spit soot as, like, an attack. And like I said, that's soot. If you breathe that in, you're not going to be able... You're going to be coughing. You're going to be hacking. It gets in your eyes. You're not going to be able to... Like, you ever sit around a fire, right? Like, you ever sit around a fire, and then the fire just blows the smoke right in your face, and you're like, oh, man. And then you move over to the next seat, and then the wind changes, and it just blows right into your face again. And that's just your life. Yeah. Imagine Karasu's main ability being that, all right? I also thought of another one that's basically kind of like a bombardment, because since we're going along with soot, and soot is connected to, you know, smoke and smog and pollution and that kind of stuff. You could literally have a technique where Karasu just spews a bunch of soot into the atmosphere, into the air, makes a cloud of soot, and it just rains down on you. But each of the rain droplets are like a little mini crow that are just like like bombarding you and like stabbing into you. Just, ah! you know, it's just like a crow rain or whatever. It's really neat. Oh my god. Okay. You know how I know that I live in the country? <laughs> um, the other day, uh, a couple weeks ago actually, I saw somebody driving a car, like a sedan, and they had modified this sedan to run on diesel fuel. So they had, they welded a smokestack, like, on the hood of this car. It was like a, it was like an old, like, Toyota or whatever, and there's just smoke just billowing out of this smokestack welded to the hood of this that's been modded to run on diesel fuel. And I just looked at that, and I'm just like, yep. I still live in Pennsylvania. I, I every once in a while I want to check. Like, do I still live in Pennsylvania? Yep, yep, I do. Okay, cool. So yeah, there's that. But uh, yeah, I mean, if we're going with the aspect of like pollution here, and that soot is like kind of connected to of like diseases and like lung problems and things like that. Like my grandfather worked in the coal mines for like 40 years, and he worked in the coal mines back in like the 30s and 40s. Okay, back during the time period where all the modern safety stuff didn't exist, and even now it's a danger his job but dude yeah so he worked in the mines you know black lung all that stuff that that is literally Karasu's ability which I, I have to feel because Karasu is a member of the Revolutionary Army and he's a nice guy like every time you hear Karasu just speak to the other commanders or just hanging out he's not a very cruel dude he looks very intimidating he's bald he's wearing the plague mask he manipulates this he's just this black fog this miasma of of just like dirt essentially it's soot, you know, which isn't far off from just like dirt or ash, you know, or smog, and then he summons crows to like attack you, you know, like if you if you were just hanging out in a village one day, and just like everything is happy and awesome, and then you saw Karasu just roll into town, you would be thinking like death literal death is here to pay you a visit and just like, oh my god, no, run away and you know what, I'm sure Karasu that makes him a sad crow Look at that. Look at Karasu. You don't want Karasu to be sad. You want him to be happy. Like this crow. You can't really tell because it's a crow. But it's it's happy. Trust me. This bird is very happy right now. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Um, But, yeah. Like, giant giant form of a crow, crow rain, you know, smoke and smog and, and soot everywhere. Like, honestly, like... A technique that he could use, kind of taking a page out of Magellan here, is that he could just take the shape of the crow and just get rid of that and just have it be a cloud of soot. Because if he just summons a cloud of soot that he just sends into the enemy ranks, they're going to be blinded, they're going to be coughing, they're not going to be able to breathe, okay? Um, I don't know if they would outright die from that. Well, like in our world, if you just walked into a cloud of soot and you couldn't get out, you would probably just eventually suffocate, right? Because you can't just keep breathing that shit in. I mean, this is one piece, so you can do whatever, but like, they might be a little bit tougher, you know, you're like, oh, stop breathing or whatever, and they can like, you know, hold their breath for longer, so they might be able to get away with it. But just like, in terms of like a crowd control kind of ability. Karasu could do that definitely. Unless, what if Karasu has trained so well in the form of the crow 
What if he just can't turn his... It has to be a crow. Whenever he separates his body, whenever he gets separated or whatever, he, he goes formless. It has to take the form of a crow. He can't do anything else. He can't make any other animals. He can't make a cloud of soot. It has to be a crow. He might have simultaneously high spec his fruit in, in uh, like a sensory angle, ways that no other Logia has been capable of, but might have also been like a detriment to the way other Logias fight. You know what I mean? For that reason. I don't know. But um, Karasu's Devil Fruit is certainly out of all of the Revolutionary Army commanders. Uh, Bello Betty's is very interesting. Morley's is really cool, the push push fruit. Um, Lindbergh, like I said, doesn't have one. He's just a steampunk cat mink. And Sabo has the Mara Mara no me. Oh yeah! And people have also brought up the, uh, the connection between that because Sabo creates fire with the Mara Mara, and a byproduct of fire, a byproduct of burning, depending on what you are burning, is soot. So Karasu and Sabo working together would actually probably create some really cool uh, combo attacks. Like Karasu sends a crow and then, you know, you know, Sabo lights it on fire. I'm not sure if that makes sense, lighting the byproduct of a fire on fire. But once again, anime, it's cool. Burning Crow just goes running in and just hits and then just explodes in fire. And just like, ah! You know, it catches fire and everything like that. That'd be um, some people have even said the reason that Sabo was able to summon Karasu in the last chapter was because he used his fire fruit to create soot, which then summoned Karasu. Or Sar Karasu could then use to manipulate to turn into a crow to communicate with Sabo. In which case, I feel that's even more impressive. Sabo using his own devil fruit to burn something to create soot that then Karasu can control several miles away. That's impressive. That is very, very impressive, okay? You know what's also weird is I was actually looking into the bounties of the Revolutionary Army commanders because I was thinking, what if Karasu had the highest bounty? Karasu's bounty is 400 million, which is very impressive, but uh, Betty's is higher. Bello Betty's is like 457, probably because of her ability to actively rally everybody together is, is more dangerous, probably in the government's eyes. Uh, Morley's bounty is only like 293 million, and Lindbergh's was like 300 million something. I think, and Sabo's is like 602, although it might have gone up since then. So yeah, Morley, I think, has the lowest bounty out of all of the Revolutionary Army commanders. And then it goes uh, Lindbergh, then Karasu, then Betty, and then it's uh, Sabo. And we still don't know. We don't know Ivankov's bounty yet. Uh, it's higher than 100 million because Ivankov was originally sentenced to level 5 in Impel Down. But other than that, we don't know. And then Dragons, we still don't know either, which is probably very, very high. And I don't think we know any of the Vice Commanders either, uh, like Inazuma or anything. But um, yeah, that's Karasu's Devil Fruit. That's how he uses it and how I think he got it. Uh, let's end this out on a crow pun, and then let's go into Urchin Facts. So you're getting an Animal Fact double feature. You're Getting crow facts and urchin facts in this video. Life is good. All right, let's see. We got one more here. What's another good one? Uh, oh, yes. What do you call it when a bunch of crows murder a chicken? Or what do you call it when a bunch of crows kill a chicken? It is a murder most foul. A murder most foul. All right, go to the urchin fact intro already. Let's get out of here. <laughs> urchin facts. Urchin facts. Do -do -do. Urchin facts! Do -do -do. All right, urchin facts. Uh, all right, just more about urchins being so fascinating. Okay, so number one, let's look at the anatomy of an urchin. Look at this thing. Look at this thing. It looks like a damn UFO. It looks like some kind of spaceship, really. It does not look like a biological organism, but a biological organism it is. Um, so little things about uh, urchins. Okay, so they don't have a proper brain. Um, they have a nervous system that uh, basically coalesces in the center of their being. So Aristotle back in the day, was, I guess, in the habit of cutting up some urchins and looking inside. And there's a particular organ of the urchin that he deemed the lantern. And if you look at it from this perspective, you can see why Aristotle thought that it looked like a lantern, all right? So this is like the center of the urchin. This is where the nervous system kind of coalesces in a ring. It's a very simple kind of system. It's also part of their mouth. So this is the mouth of a sea urchin. They're basically these five plates that are called pyramids because of their shape. 
and they basically close together like this to either crack open something that they're eating or to like scrape something off. The effectiveness of the mouth of a sea urchin, these teeth, these pyramid teeth coming out and grasping things has been so efficient. They've actually adapted it into the rovers that are going to Mars. So literally they're like, oh, that's really cool. The urchin can grab things off the sea floor with these mouths and grasp them very well and like, like maintain a hold. So we'll adapt that into a rover that will then go to Mars and then we'll then grasp the sand and take it back to Earth. That's really cool, okay? So like these five plates that all close in together there. That's pretty neat. Um, let's see here. Uh, they have a five-part stomach. So, you know, you thought cows were cool for having four sections of a stomach. No, urchins have five. That's pretty cool. Um, they are very sensitive to both touch, light, and very various chemicals around them. So they don't have proper eyes or anything, but they don't need eyes. That's how badass urchins are. So, yeah, that's our urchin fact for the day and your several crow facts or crow puns for the day. Hope you enjoyed the video, everybody. This will be Teching signing out. Later, everyone.